I'd like to call this meeting of the Ellsworth Planning Board to order, Wednesday, July 1st, 2020, 5.30 p.m. The first thing to do is the roll call. I'm John Fink. John DeLeo? Here. 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 Mark Rich? Not here. Rick Lyles? Here. David Burks? Here. Nelson Geal? Here. Okay. Next item is adoption of the minutes from the June 3rd meeting. Has anyone a motion regarding the minutes? So moved. Second. Okay. Any additions or corrections to the minutes? Hearing none, all uh, sort of raise our hands. Okay, minutes are adopted. Next item of business is uh, a recognition of Roger Lassard's 10 years of service. On behalf of the planning board, I would like to take this opportunity to express our sincere gratitude to Roger for his many years of service. He began his career in January of 2010 and for the past decade, Roger has been a dedicated and active member of the board. He also served as the board secretary from May of 2019 until just this past June. I'd like to thank him for his participation and all of his contributions to the city of Ellsworth. You're here. The next time of business, a final plan review for a major use site development plan entitled Ellsworth RV for Bernie and Selena Gordon. The proposal is to construct us four self storage unit buildings, total of 9,600 square feet on a 3.09 acre property located at 314 Bucksport Road, tax map 25, lot two, located in the urban zone. Is someone representing the applicant, please? Pulsbury and Andrew McCullough. Okay, go ahead, please. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, a couple mop-up items from our last meeting. There were three requests from the May 28th TRT memo that we revised our plan to show the signature block. We got the lot dimensional table uh, here in the corner of the plan. And uh, we have a financial capacity letter from Barber Bank and Trust now as part of the application. Uh, we've also revised our stormwater maintenance plan, which is included in the materials tonight. We contacted the Department of Transportation and were assured there would be no permitting from the department required. And I forwarded the email reply I got from the department to the staff because that came in after the submission requirements. But rest assured we have that. Um, I also submitted a waiver request regarding the stormwater management. That's gonna be, I, I denoted that as page 3.01 of the application. Um, and I go through uh, the ordinance requirements for a waiver in, in the last page are my bullet points uh, supporting my request for the waiver. Questions from the board. Yeah, what is, uh, I, I've got a question. Uh, I'm at a kind of sort of a disadvantage. I'm down in Virginia right now. Um, so can we, is this something new, the waiver request? Yes, it's part of this month's submission. Okay. Yes, this is, this is a little different than what we had proposed a month ago. Um, we've, uh, thank you for asking. We, we were negotiating with the adjoining owner to essentially drain the water directly into the um, flowage that's uh, 40 feet or so behind the property. You can see on the map here, this blue area, that's a, a flowage of several acres in size on uh, the Bridge Twin property. Uh, we've received a uh, signed easement 
to drain our water off our property directly into that pond. So we've eliminated a small detention pond that we initially had behind the four buildings. And uh, we propose a plunge pools now uh, between each building to um, capture and slow down the water a little bit and the water will run from behind the buildings into the pond. Uh, so we need a waiver for that from the planning board because the, technically the flow of the stormwater is greater post-development than pre-development, but by having the neighbor's permission and acceptance of that stormwater, that foregoes the need for us to, to, to do that. Because that, with that stormwater easement, we now have rights to flow that water to the pond. Um, Thanks, Steve, for that explanation. I, I guess if the if the neighbors don't mind, I guess it's it's fine. Yep, no, we've asked for and, and we're granted a, a written um, easement, which we will record and register your deeds um, if if you so approve the project for us tonight. I have a um, question on on that pond, Steve. Yeah, uh, and and looking at the the tax maps, and I understand on the city website, and boundary lines might not be exact, but but it appeared with a on the tax maps that some of that pond, I believe that you're talking about, actually goes over onto Pete Weezer's property, which would be the property uh, just to the east of uh, Bridge Twins' pro uh, the, property. The car dealer is John. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's where it's, that's the direction of the flow. Ultimately, but what I'm saying the is, direction is that, in, in, in water drains under Bucksport Road and then traverses down to Union River eventually. But I mean, the easement is for, from Bridge Twin. So the, that water from this development could go into that pond. Yes. But it appears from the tax map that part of the pond is on Pete Weezer's property. So I just wonder if, if Pete is aware of, of this. Uh, well, there's actually two ponds. Recommendation. The, the pond is split by a road and, and underneath the road um, is a culvert. So this, this pond is kind of dammed up by the access road that goes out to some old gravel pits and goes underneath the power line. Um, maybe, 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 that road. maybe I was thinking of the, the pond that's to the east of it. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a separate pond. It's all the same okay. flowage. I'll, I'll grant you that. I have one okay. question. It's kind of more general. I, mean, I have no basic problem with the uh, uh, what's been presented here and so forth. But I want to ask a question. Um, if in fact uh, down the line uh, it becomes apparent that there was a significant miscalculation or whatever of uh, uh, stormwater that comes off the property into some other property, whether it goes you know onto somebody's you know pond or whatever. But my question is, is, is it within our purview to say you know that there has to be uh, something on paper to say that uh, you know that that'll be mitigated by the uh, by the, whoever the applicant might be. And again, I'm not, this is more a more general question than just this particular development. Can John or somebody answer that? Jana? Or not? It's a good question. Yeah, um, good question. I, the ordinance really addresses over boundary lines. If it, so I don't have a direct answer for you. If you can live with ambiguity, good. <laughs> no, I'd, I'd offer any time a developer, you know, burdens, overburdens somebody's property, ultimately they're responsible to fix it. We've had instances around town where developments have had some initial issues, but they, you know, we come around and fix up the problems. Okay, can can the can the city enforce that sort of thing? Yeah, it's usually more of a civil matter between neighbors. Yeah. But okay, 
I was going to take a crack at it, but I would let Dwight kind of uh, add to it as well, is that when that easement is signed, it's almost like an agreement that we're, we're allowing this to happen. And then um, it then becomes a civil matter between the the two property owners that are in the in the vicinity of the area. Uh, that, that would be in this particular case, you know, because you have the easement and all that kind of good stuff. But what happens if, let's say, the uh, water, um, uh, again, a miscalculated amount of the flow, in other words, a, a larger flow, were to go straight into the, uh, to the river or whatever, um, and there was no other property owner, because that's kind of taken care of here, but what if, it, what, if, what if the water just went into the river or whatever? Uh, and it was an unexpected amount. Is there anything that does this? Do we have? Does the city have any recourse? <clears throat> I don't know if we really would. Um, if if what I'm looking at what the surface area is of water that's going to be going into that pond and what the surface area of that pond is, I think even if you've got a three or four inch rain event, I don't think you'd see any difference in the pool going into the Union River. I mean, that's quite a distance to travel. Oh, yeah. The, the, I, the, the question really is more general than just this particular development. Uh, and I mean, I'm good with what uh, what Steve has said and so forth, and uh, what's been presented to us. But I'm just asking the question more generally because I think it's going. I'm going to ask the same question uh, with the Foster Street thing. So, anyway, all right. I think I think Rick, we would have to determine the source of where the extra flowage is coming from. You okay. know you don't really know where it's going to be coming from, especially if there's a significant amount of properties that abut a, a water source or that drainage system. So um, it would have to, we would have to try to pinpoint, you know, where the water's coming from um, and follow up with, you know, and, and if that, let's say it's coming off a property that went to the planning board and got approval for stormwater um, and there's an issue with the stormwater maintenance system, then we address it that way. If it's something that's an existing use, um, really it's hard for us to go and um, enforce something, uh, work with that landowner and ask them if there's, um, you know, ways that they could try to rectify the issue knowing that it's a problem. But in terms of the ordinance, I don't know if we'd have any standing. Okay. Well, I'll ask a good question again with respect to the foster thing, which is, uh, you know, more salient kind of problem. So, but thanks, Steve. Didn't mean to detract from this particular development. No problem. Well, Steve, is, is Andrew McCulloch on, on the Zoom meeting? Is Andrew here? I, I, yes, I am. Okay. Uh, Andrew, I just wonder, I'm, on page 62, you have your one paragraph letter. I mean, could you kind of explain that? I mean, normally, unless I'm missing something, we would have, you know, how much rain goes off site, you know, in a 2.7 inch storm and a 5.4 inch storm. Uh, so I kind of don't understand the, the okay, data that we've been so far. Okay, you didn't receive a copy of the calculations themselves? Uh, you know, I may have. Um, let me bring them up. Uh, just, just to give you a little bit of an overview, um, the, the peak flow after construction is only higher than pre-development peak flow for about 30 minutes or less. So it's a very short time period that their actual, the actual new peak is higher than the old. Um, let's see. So, If we were to combine the two study points together for existing conditions, we would have, do you have the table, John? Uh, you know, I'm not sure, Andrew. Okay. 
But I mean, I think I do. <laughs> okay. So for existing conditions, two-year event, uh, 1.90. And for developed conditions, if we combine the two, it's 3.40. So that's, that's peak flow, um, but that, again, that peak flow only is higher than existing conditions for less than 30 minutes. Um, for the 5.4 inch storm event, we have existing conditions of 5.68, and then developed conditions of 8.58. Okay, I mean, basically on, on your letter dated June 23rd, which I call in your conclusion that uh, this equates to a potential increase in the surface level with open water of 0 0.2 inches over five acres. So, I mean, that would be the maximum amount that the uh, storm water from this property going into the pond would raise the level of the pond? That, that, that is correct. Um, and, and that only if the, if we were in a situation where the outflow was full and so there was no water flowing out. Um, with, provided that the outfall isn't completely full, um, you know, in reality, there would be probably no increase. Okay, thank you. I'm good. I'd like to go through the bullets on part two of the TRT report. Um, it's like we've been, we've covered bullet three, uh, which is the stormwater condition plan and the easement. Um, so I'd like to cover the other three bullets. Bullet one, applicant application states parcel size is 3.09 acres. Uh, site plan states parcel size at three plus or minus acres. Uh, applicant should clarify discrepancy. Can we do that now? Yes, we'll we'll amend the plan to show 3.09 acres. Okay. So it's consistent with the application. And bullet two is applicant to change rural zone requirements to urban zone requirements on the plan. Yep, we'll change that uh, header on the table. That's regarding the, the setbacks and dimensional requirements. Uh, bullet three is the stormwater conversation. Bullet four, application states proposed developed area 90,000 square feet and then service area 50,300 square feet. Site plan notes, developed area 72,079 square feet and an impervious area 50,184 square feet. Applicant should reconcile the discrepancy. Can you speak to that? Yes, the last two figures are correct. I will revise page two of the written application to, uh, to reflect uh, 72,079 square feet of impervious, I mean, uh, developed area and 50,184 feet of impervious. So I'll amend page two to be consistent okay. with the plan. Thank you. Anyone else have a question or comment? Very quiet bunch. This is a public hearing. Anyone may comment upon this matter. Uh, Ms. Does anyone wish to speak out there in the wide world? I don't see anything on my side yet, but there's a little bit of a delay, so we'll uh... Wait a couple moments. Have you got anything, Dwight?
I've got nothing, Nate. I believe we have nothing then. In that case, I will close the public hearing and just comment that it's sad that no one wants wants to uh, interact with us anymore. So don't take uh, it personal. No, uh, John should take it personally. It's all his fault. Yes, that's that's what I was chosen to to be. I'm the um, I'm the designated uh, bad guy. So, what would the board like to do with this application? Hold on, I will say that their comment just came in and it says, oh. we're here, just no questions to ask. <laughs> okay, well, at, least, at least we're not all alone. <laughs> so what so would the board like to do? Thank you. <laughs> now, what would the board like to do with this application? It has been found, previously found to be complete. Is the board going to be satisfied with the uh, material presented to us? I move that the final plan review for a major uh, use site development plan entitled Ellsworth R slash V for Bernie and Selena Gordon be accepted with the details as, with additional details as in the agenda. Is there a second? Uh, there's a second, but uh, do we need to put something in there for granting a waiver for stormwater? Mm. In, in, in the motion? Jan, yes? Okay. Yes. yes. Do we wish to grant the uh, request for waiver? Any thoughts on that? I'm good with it personally. And we can amend the motion as far as I'm concerned to include it, if that's okay. Anyone else? Yeah, I mean, I was satisfied with Andrew's uh, explanation that uh, there'd be, I mean, very little impact on that, uh, the water, the storm water going into that pond. And there's no impact on the health uh, welfare of the citizens of Ellsworth. So uh, with that change to the motion, the second still accept that change? Yeah, the second will. Okay. Any further discussion on it? If not all, please indicate your preference. John? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm not hearing for, let's just see. I don't have all the uh, little uh, windows. Is a yes. David? Yeah. What's, okay. So, okay. In that case, we have disposed of item number five. The next item is a final plan for review of a major use site development and major subdivision entitled Foster Street Apartments for DC Pre Pre-Development LLC. The proposal is to construct 30, 53 apartment units, two market rate, 12 unit buildings, and one senior housing 29 unit building on a 6.16 acre parcel tax map 131 lots 13, 14, and a portion of 17 located on Foster Street and Oriel Way located in the urban and downtown zones. Is someone representing the applicant, please? Uh, yes, Kevin Bunker with Developers Collaborative Pre-Development, the uh, development consultant and owner of the project. And uh, Nancy's here as well. Okay, go ahead, please. Yeah, um, I'm not gonna make a presentation because you've heard one presentation and you've seen the materials once. I think you probably know what your questions are and there has some, been some back and forth with TRT, responses, peer reviews, that sort of thing. So I think rather the re than okay. present, The reason I'm asking for a, at least a quick go through is for the, for the public who may not have been observing the previous meeting. Sure, that's fine, I can do that. So basically our site plan, like you said, is a 53 unit <clears throat> Uh, apartment project in two phases. The first phase would be a 29 unit affordable senior housing building 
financed through the Maine State Housing Authority. And the second phase would be two 12 unit market rate buildings, rental apartments, two bedrooms, approximately $1,300 a month in rent. And the financing is in place now for the first phase and we're just trying to get the closing between detailed design, um, final financing, and of course city approvals, those sorts of things to go to construction this fall. And the other one will be a little bit more market dependent, uh, but we're, we're working on that one as well. Um, in terms of other, in terms of going through the, the site plan itself, I'm going to leave that to Nancy, uh, but um, the senior housing is 62 plus, and I could talk a little bit more about that if folks are interested, or um, just move on. And uh, the market rate housing is intended to be targeted toward the workforce. Uh, tip, there are some workers nearby, particularly Jackson Labs has a a lot of employees nearby that sort of fit into this income band where we think they can afford about 1300 a month. So we're trying to design a building to capture that market, I think, as others are beginning to do in the region. So that's a that's a real brief overview. It's a, it's a second phase. These two phases are themselves a second phase for us as we did the Oriole Way apartments immediately prior um, just to the north. And there's 50 units up there that we did in our first purchase from the owners of the shopping center buying their excess land. So that's my, my presentation. I'm happy to turn it over to Nancy now if she wants to go through the major site elements just for folks who are unfamiliar that may be listening and then we can maybe get into the comments or whatever you guys want to do. Mr. Chairman? Nancy? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, if someone in your IT group would allow me to do a screen share, I do have an image up here that may help uh, the folks viewing. Nate, can that be done? Um, uh, did you actually uh, share or do you not have the share option right now? I, I can share, yes. Let's see here. I'm attempting to share. <laughs> For some reason, I'm not able to share. I don't uh, know why. Uh, that's unfortunate. Uh, Jenna, do you happen to have the image that we filed as part of the application materials? Which one? <laughs> uh, there's a color rendering I was going to talk from. Let me see if I can pull it up for you. Which one? <laughs> Thanks, Mike. <laughs> that works. Yeah, if you want to give it another go there, Nancy, I, I believe all the settings are enabled, so you, you should be able to share, but uh, why it may not on your machine, I'm not sure. I don't understand either. Um, I've been able to do it previously in other Zoom meetings, so... Um, not quite sure. Well, that's unfortunate, and I do apologize for that. I'm not sure why technically we're not able to do that uh, at this time. Uh, anyway. Looks like I have sharing. I don't know if I have what you want me to share, but it looks like I can share. I'm not blocked from it. Yeah. It's not, it's not allowing me to do it. Uh, anyway. Well, let's get sort of going with that. Uh, you folks have plans in front of you, I'm sure, as part of the application materials. Uh, this site was last before you on May 6th, and at that time, uh, we were granted preliminary approval for the project. As you recall, the project is two phases. Uh, the first phase is the 29-unit senior uh, affordable housing uh, building, which is located off of Oriole Way. Uh, Oriole Way um, has frontage uh, 
it has a connector onto Foster Street and onto Washington Street. Uh, it was constructed a few years ago. The second phase of this project uh, are the two 12 unit market rate buildings which are located uh, on Foster Street. And um, as part of the next agenda item, if you um, re would recall, there are options for um, a subdivision review uh, for that that would create the lots that are being conveyed to the applicant as part of that. So that would be another agenda item to, to discuss. From our last conversations that we had with you folks, there are a few things that uh, have changed on the plans and those were in response to comments that we received from you, uh, comments that were received from the staff and additional internal review uh, as part of our ongoing project uh, design efforts. So focusing in on phase one, uh, that's the 29 unit senior affordable housing. Uh, if you recall from our last discussions with the board, there were two parking spaces that were being set aside in phase one for uh, future needs for phase two. Uh, with the changes that have happened in phase two, we've actually eliminated those two parking spaces and sort of made the parking area in phase one a little bit more compact. We also, as part of phase one, uh, eliminated the grass under drain soil filter, which had been located on the uh, south side of the parking lot in phase one. That avoided a small pocketed wetland area that's located in that location. So we have no wetland impacts uh, associated with the project. We, in the, limit, the elimination of the grass under drain soil filter number one, we actually uh, adjusted the sizing on grass under drain soil filter two and that is the only uh, grass under drain soil filter on the project in phase one. You also recall from the plan, we eliminated a, a significant area of retaining wall. We do have a small uh, section of retaining wall, what would be near the southwest uh, corner of the parking area, uh, but that is it in phase one. Phase two, uh, if you recall from the discussions, one of the items that was uh, talked a bit about was with regard to the number of driveway points of access onto Foster Street. We have uh, consolidated that. We have one point of access now uh, onto Foster Street, and we've designed that um, location to be able to allow a fire truck to access in uh, to the site uh, from Foster Street. With the uh, dead end configuration, we also adjusted the parking uh, so that 36 parking spaces, the amount required for the number of uh, units in that phase, are all provided in that phase. So uh, the need for a parking deferment uh, was something that was, uh, can be eliminated as our, our prior request on that. Uh, so with that, we had a couple of other changes to that area we've eliminated. Uh, a snow storage location that was a, a staff comment that came up as part of our TRT review on the 18th. Uh, we've added additional information with regard to site distance. That letter was provided uh, today as a result of a follow-up site visit that was done um, by the traffic engineer last week uh, during full leaf on conditions. And we can talk a bit about that uh, as well. Um, but that kind of gives you a general overview sort of as to what the changes were uh, that were on the plans. Today we received the peer review comments uh, from your town's uh, peer review engineer, uh, CES. There were a couple of comments that they had. One was with regard to uh, the stormwater application materials that we filed. We filed as a stormwater permit by rule. They suggested that we follow up with the DEP to determine whether that actually would be a permit by rule or an actual stormwater review. Uh, we have had discussions with the DEP. Uh, their position is that we would likely have to have a stormwater permit. So that um, is a bit of a change in their review, but the application materials uh, for the plan work has been filed for that and we'll continue to work with the DEP on that. The second item in the CES review with, re with regard to perimeter uh, erosion control mix firms uh, in their placement mm -hmm. along the perimeter, a couple of adjustments there, which we'll take care of. And then the third item was with regard to specification requirements for uh, precast manholes to meet H20 loading uh, requirements, which in the specifications for the project, that is noted in there, but we'll also note it on the plan as requested. So uh, with that, Mr. Chair, I'll turn it over to you folks for any questions. Question from the board. None. 
I have a question regarding the um, traffic report here. This dated letter dated June 29th. It says that the the clearing of vegetation on the all areas of the uh, access is that something in control of the applicant? There are two areas that were cited in the uh, application uh, response letter, if you will, uh, to the follow-up um, site distance letter. One is at the existing intersection of Oriole Way and Washington Street. There are a couple of trees there that the traffic engineer recommended be removed. Those are in an area that is controlled either by the city in the right-of-way or by the owners of Oriole Way Apartments. And that is something that we would be able to coordinate with them to be able to remove those. Uh, the second one is with regard to some tree clearing and limbing along Foster Street. And that's on the adjacent property, which is located to the east of the site frontage on Foster Street. In that particular area, the sidewalk and uh, the pavement are very close to the right-of-way line. Uh, so it may be a case where there is clearing that has to happen on the abutters property. Uh, we have uh, from the assessor's database a PO box uh, to be able to coordinate with them. We do not have a phone number, but we'd like to coordinate further with the city staff uh, to be able to have them help facilitate uh, getting in contact with those people and doing some of that clearing. It's, it's a minor amount of clearing. It's about 150 feet. Uh, that may be impacted along the sidewalk edge and the clearing is actually coming out and over the sidewalk. Uh, the limbs are coming out and over the sidewalk now. So uh, that's the recommendation for clearing in the second area. That's in phase two. Um, that's not anything that would affect phase one. Phase one has come out uh, clear, if you will, uh, with no need for any uh, further clearing limits. However, Although the letter says that the city site distance is met, it's only met with the clearing of vegetation. That is correct. And therefore the board would be, I think remiss not to put a condition on the, on approval of nothing happens until those, that vegetation clearing is, is done. We certainly understand that Mr. Chairman. What we'd like to ask you folks to consider is that that condition be placed only on phase two uh, in that phase one would be allowed to uh, happen without that uh, requirement. Well, I think it's, I think it's okay to place the condition on both because the trees haven't, the two trees haven't yet been cut down. But I think, I think maybe a finer point of what Nancy is saying is that one issue is linked to phase one and one issue is linked to phase two. And it's not that both issues are linked to both phases. Okay, anyone else wish to uh, comment or question? Actually, John, I have similar questions on the site distance. <clears throat> I understand, and I was not on the board back when Oreo Way was approved. And so the, the site distance issue for Oreo Way at Washington Street, uh, I mean, there should have been 250 feet of site distance uh, for this for the previous plan to be approved and I mean in the traffic solutions report and I think everybody agrees that, that if you come out of Oreo Way on Washington Street the, the visibility the sight distance is severely limited and and this has gone on for I mean how long have people been living in Oreo Way two years now uh, I'm a little concerned that I mean it was approved to begin with um, maybe there was some discussion of those that vegetation being removed, but apparently it wasn't removed. And but now we're dealing with vegetation on Foster Street, uh, impacting the the market rate apartments on Foster Street. You know, can we be assured that that is going to be taken care of? Uh, you know, your track record for sight distance is, is not very good. Mr. Chairman, if I might add, um, we did go back and look at the original traffic study that was done in phase two. I was not aware of any recommendations for any clearing in that location. I don't recall that it was a condition of approval, but certainly members of the board may, may have a better recollection of that. But um, I too, Mr. DeLeo asked the same question, if it was you know a phase one 
issue, why was it not addressed at that point? Um, and I, I don't have a good answer for you on that. I mean, part of the answer is we, we submit our plans for review and we, we do what you guys tell us to do. So, I mean, our, our track record not being good with sight distance isn't really, I mean, we, we submit plans and we do everything that we're supposed to do. So I don't, I don't, if we weren't told this, I don't know how, and our, we didn't have a traffic engineer tell us that. I don't know where we were deficient, if indeed we are deficient. Maybe it's two engineers had two different opinions. I don't know. I would, I would and, like, to, go ahead, John. Uh, okay, uh, just, I mean, Kevin, I'm not totally blaming you. I mean, I, you know, there may be some deficiencies on the city's part that, uh, I mean, they're aware of what the site distance should be and, and possibly, you know, going back a couple of years when the previous uh, development was approved, you know, maybe there was something that these trees should be cut down and, and you know, we didn't uh, follow through, uh, but I, you know, I, I just want to make sure that you know whatever conditions, whatever you know, whatever the site distance, whatever the conditions we set on it, that is is taken care of by both the applicant and the city staff. Well, if we put on a condition that the site distances, because we're only concerned now with Foster Street, are met before anything else happens, then that should assure everyone that that will be taken care of. I would like to add one other comment. Uh, I, I appreciate Kevin uh, that you took my two driveway uh, displeasure into great heart and changed it to one driveway on Foster Street. So I, I certainly, I was pleasantly surprised to, to see the new plans with just the one driveway. My candy is probably uh, mad at me now, but uh, but I appreciate you taking my comment to heart. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, I have a I have a, I have a drainage question, and the reason why. Let me just preface that by saying the reason why um, you know the drainage is of uh, so important is is because of the past problems, not necessarily with stuff that you guys have done, but just in that area. Uh, and so forth. So my question is this, you know, I understand how the, uh, the detention pond or whatever to the, I guess it's to the West works. And, and I get that, you know, according to all the calculations, it's kind of okay. And it presumably won't be overtopped with the, with the uh, different storms and so forth. My question is this though, um, the calculations as far as I can tell, and, and, you know, there was a lot and I didn't go through them all, you know, word by word, but the calculations are based on runoff coefficients that, uh, you know, some are over grass, uh, some of the runoff is over grass, some of it's off the of driveways or whatever, okay? Um, and, 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 the, and the detention pond is presumably adequate. My, my question though is, is if in fact we get a situation where we have snow cover, uh, well, frozen ground with snow cover and a crusty surface over that, which we get every spring, okay? Uh, basically what happens is the runoff coefficient uh, increases, or the CN as you call it, increases a lot, okay, from like, you know, 0.6 or 7 or whatever to almost 1, okay. My question is, um, if that were to be the case, does that, um, uh, does that detention pond get overtopped if a lot more of the runoff actually goes across the, uh, the land there? Is that clear? I mean... You understand what I'm asking? I, I think I understand um, your question. And it's a situation where sort of, a, a, I won't say fictitious, but um, something that's typically yeah, let's not. Let's not call it fictitious. No, no, but um, it's typically something that's not uh, addressed specifically in a design as far as modeling Essentially, what you're you seem to be describing is almost a total impervious area uh, condition, and you know, we we do our designs and our calculations based on the methodology that's outlined in the ordinance, and which is outlined by the DEP. Uh, we look at ground cover conditions, whether that's impervious cover or grass areas, 
typically what you do see is in heavy winter cover conditions, you don't get a tremendous amount of times where you're going to have a rainfall event that is going to cover the entire area. If you do have some ice and rain, it may end up going sort of through the snow coming down into those areas. We do have access from the paved areas of the site into our storm drain system. Those points of access would be open uh, as far as the winter maintenance. So as far as anything coming off of the pavement area that would be able to get into the piping system and down into the pond area. Our pond does have some freeboard, if you will, uh, so that there is excess before it would reach the um, heights of the berm uh, in that area. Uh, so we do have some excess uh, freeboard based on the storm sizing for the two uh, requirements that are at the local level. And so we've done our analysis, we've had it peer reviewed by your peer reviewer, and our analysis does meet the ordinance requirements uh, for sizing uh, and for the, the standard conditions that would, do, would be done in stormwater modeling. If you have a situation where you've got a frozen ground condition and a rainstorm event, you're going to have that everywhere. It's not going to be specific to this project that's happening everywhere in the community at that time. Well, sure, but if you're building a new project to catch water that before it goes into the street, you know, you want to catch it all. So my question is, with respect to your freeboard, is there enough freeboard there to accommodate uh, an additional runoff that may occur because of, uh, uh, you know, a different uh, runoff coefficient? Now, in other words, a different percentage of the water that's going to run off versus you know, if it was uh, unfrozen and just grassy? So from a analysis standpoint on our site, we are collecting runoff from all of our impervious areas. It's all going into that system. Uh, as you can see from our analysis, if you, if you have sort of looked at the, the analysis points, the two sort of natural site outlets that were uh, discharging uh, through the site in a natural condition, we have greatly reduced the amount of peak flow going to those outlets by collecting and controlling all of the runoff from the developed portion of our site into our stormwater system. We're then piping it down through phase two and connecting into the municipal system in Foster Street and doing some upgrades in that section as well. So from our analysis, typically uh, on a site like this, in order to meet the, the ordinance requirements, we would be required to control our runoff to equal to or less than the pre-development peak discharge calculations at the point of outlet. We took this analysis a step further and we said, we're going, con going to control the runoff from our developed area on the site, being sensitive to the fact that there is the Ellsworth Housing Authority site downstream of this property which has had concerns about stormwater for years. Uh, and we've taken it a step further by saying, we're going to collect and control the runoff from this development and not put it to the natural site outlet, but rather divert it into the municipal system that does have the capacity to discharge it and not pass through the neighbor's property. So that's a little bit different. That's a step above what would normally, normally be required uh, as part of a normal site design if this property were located in an area that didn't have such sensitivity on the downstream side. Okay, so I go back to the, the question I asked with the other development then, and thank you. I mean, I, that was good. Um, but, but is there something that, the, that can be added into an approval or whatever that, uh, or, or doesn't it need to be, I guess, is the question. Uh, that if, if in fact the detention pond gets overtopped because of, you know, a rainfall over frozen land, okay, and I, I, I heard you, okay, um, but is there some way that we can put that uh, caveat in there somewhere? In the, in, the, in the, when I say in there, I mean in the approval somehow? Or is it enough to say, you know, if this happens, um, you know, the city will, you know, sue the developer or whatever? But you've also got to keep in mind that with this particular design, the analysis has shown that our system is sufficient to handle 
the storm events required by the ordinance. Right, if there but, were, but it's the runoff coefficients that are, are key. Understand, but those are the runoff coefficients that are used in the designs of consistently all sites that are done throughout the state. No, 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 no. The runoff, the runoff coefficients depends on the assumptions that you make about what kind of ground you have. So, you know, um, the runoff coefficient is different if it's a parking lot for a grassy area or whatever. Okay. And you go through your calculations and you do an average runoff coefficient based on those two different things. What I'm suggesting is that there may be greater, more land that has a uh, higher runoff coefficient than you, than you used in your designs. So the runoff coefficient on a paved area is 98%. So right. that the only other analysis point that you would have to do is to assume that the entire development area were paved. And I don't think that's realistic to size and design something for that uh, in a case situation where, you know, that may or may not happen at some point during the winter season. Um, I think the other thing to keep in mind is the fact that with this particular site and with this particular uh, design where we are collecting and diverting our flow into the pipe to municipal system, that even if there were a situation where there was a higher amount of runoff, we're still well below what the current rates of flow are coming down through those existing ravines. And even if you, you know, take a look at that and say, okay, well, what if the worst case scenario happened? It would be essentially no different than what you would have now in that condition. Okay, and I, I mean, I buy all that. I mean, I really do. Uh, but my question is, you know, for this and for, and for other developments, you know, what is the city's recourse if in fact, you know, worst case scenario actually does happen and the, and the, either the water that's diverted to the city system can't be handled or the detention mine gets overtopped or whatever. Sometimes it gets overtopped, it's no big deal. Here, it seems to be a big deal. So my question is what's, and, and this is to Jana and whoever else with the city, is there any uh, uh, recourse? Well, Rick, what we did, uh, when we, the issues we had with the first project, Oriole Way, we had a remarkable rainstorm that dropped like four inches of the rain, two and a half hours. Sure, and that's, and that's way above the, the, the standard, I get that. But, but from that point forward, the developer was there every step of the way to try to come up with a remedy. And, we, and they had to try two or three times because once that ravine got scoured out, that silt, it didn't take much to drape, take that silt down to the next property. Uh, from what I've seen this spring, the problem has pretty much solved itself and starting to grass in now. Praying we don't have any more huge drains. But uh, I think the city can work with any developers on situations like that. Uh, and I don't see this as being as much threat as what the other project was because we are taking all of the water above that threshold to into the city stormwater system. And, and if I could just add to that, you know, when the when the phase one issues happened, there was no there was no stick held over our head to if you don't fix this, then we're going to take away your occupancy permit or anything like that. Right. We right. we came in and we fixed it and. We had to write a check for $40,000 and we did it. And th with the design of this system, it's designed beyond your ordinance because we met with the neighbors, they were concerned, they had a right to be concerned and we're making it, the site have less water than it has now. And we're gonna spend a bunch of money to do that because that's what we do. So we're meeting your ordinance, but I'm, I just want you to know, we're not just, uh, we're not going to do stuff that you force us to do. We're going to be good neighbors. That's what we. And I, and I, and I, 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 and I don't deny any of that. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I just want to make sure that the city is protected in some way. And what you're saying is on the record that it is, and that's fine with me. Great. If, would, that, if that's good enough for the city folks. I would uh, like to, if I could just say something first. The planning board does not have the um, ability to require to make requirements that are beyond what the ordinance states. So if the ordinance is inadequate, that's a, something that right now we can do nothing about. 
Go ahead. So I was just going to yeah. just going to add what was, uh, that conversation all about. Jenna may have a different Jenna may have a different um, perspective on this, but I think you know to get to the root of your question, Rick. It's if you uh, you know in those situations that you're talking about, I think the city might want to take a look at the ordinance and make sure that the standards that they're being that are they're asking for uh, developers to meet would need to be you know changed based on conditions. So so. You know, we have a, a set of rules in the ordinance that ask for um, the developer to follow, you know, um, certain codes and, and um, DEP analysis. And that's what uh, Nancy was talking about. Um, and I think it would be more of a partnership in that situation where you'd really have to kind of take a harder look at your ordinance to see if, you know, maybe we're not asking them to analyze the correct thing. But couldn't couldn't I agree with that statement more. I think I really do think that there needs to be, you know, something else um, in a, in addition to what we already have or expressed in some other way because it's not a it's not an argument about design storms. It's an argument about you know applicable runoff coefficients and so forth. Yep. And, How are you designing the stormwater management is based on what we're asking the applicant to design that those things on. And if we need to change those standards, that's another conversation, not necessarily one for what this particular application is trying to meet the standards. Other than, th other, than the, <laughs> other than the fact that the ordinances don't really re give you guidance in terms of what runoff coefficients are appropriate to use. Right, but they are using the, you know, what most engineers use, the DEP, um, you know, stormwater management rules, and they're going to have to meet, it sounds like, you know, based on CES's analysis too, they're going to have to go back and talk to DEP, and I think Nancy mentioned having to do that also. So there's a whole nother other reviews there too but it's a whole yeah the stormwater like analysis you know you just may want to take a look at that and make sure it's adequate that's all like i say couldn't agree more yep i have a question for nancy sure. um so i've heard this or part to this presentation several times now <laughs> still trying to get up my head around the stormwater situation but this project versus the oriel way apartments, is it fair to say that a fundamental difference relative to stormwater management is the uh, awareness of clarification around and access to the city drainage system on Foster Street? Because from the layman's perspective, which is where I'm coming from, it sounds like a lot of water just ran downhill from the first project. In this case, we have a water, a stormwater management system designed to outflow into the city's water management system running down Foster Street, where further clarification, I think, was gained this year relative to diameter of pipes and outflow and whatnot. Is that a fundamental difference between Project A and the current project we're looking at right now? In general, I would answer your question very simply is yes. Uh, in phase one, there were stormwater uh, provisions that were had, but those stormwater facilities did discharge into natural drainage courses uh, at the westerly end of that site. Um, there was a very, very small piece that tied into the municipal system in Washington Street, but the majority of it did go through sort of an overland passage, if you will. In this particular case, with these two uh, projects, the phase one and phase two for Foster Street Apartments, we are collecting, treating, and discharging the runoff from the developed portion of the site into a <coughs> municipal system, which is very different than what was done in Oil Way Apartments. Okay, thank you. I got a question, Nancy. Yes. Will the, the stormwater systems for Oriel Way and this project be tied together, or are they totally separate? They're separate. Okay. I was just wondering where this project where you're tying into a, well, you're installing a new stormwater drain. I was just wondering if some of the water that flows overland from Warrior Way could be captured and sent into the city system, but obviously that's not the case. There's quite a separation. Yep. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Hey, John, Hi. this is, oh, I just wanted yes. to bring up that there was a comment that came in from the public that goes back to the, um, the tree removal. Um, do you want me to read it now or do you let want me, to me let me open the public hearing so okay. it's just about to do this is a public hearing anyone may comment on this matter i have the 
I ask that you identify yourself before speaking and tell us what you what you wish. Does anyone wish to comment? So this is coming in from an anonymous attendee. I don't know how we deal with that, but um, it says hoping that a compromise can be found to save some of the vegetation that is being discussed of, of being removed. If not, maybe some vegetation can be planted before the project is deemed complete. I would just comment that the reason for the removal is a matter of safety and that perhaps replanting would just take us back to where we are now and, and as time goes by. But thank you for the comment. Any other comments come in? No? Looks like we're all set. Okay, and nothing from Dwight, huh? No. Okay, we're still, well, at least we got a comment. So what would the board like to do with this matter? One, one final question. Uh, Mike, mm -hmm. you're all good with this because it was a change in the driveways and so forth, but you're, you're all good? Yes, uh, we've discussed it a little bit and uh, the chief and I discussed it. Um, we've gone over it with Nancy a little bit. So we, we are fine with, with the driveway. The turning radiuses show that we can get in and back out uh, properly. Um, we know it's really a tight area because of the terrain and, and the actual way things are being put in there. And it's, it's really tight, but we're good with it. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. A couple more items, John. You're welcome, John. Yes. Uh, again, back to the TRT report. Uh, there's actually several more items on here I, I think we probably should discuss. Um, I'm going to jump right down to emergency access concerns addressed. Uh, on page two of the TRT report, I'll read this for the applicant's benefit if they don't have it in front of them. Based on the geotechnical report, applicant has mentioned potential changes to Foster Street apartments, retaining wall, and northern building design due to topography and soils. Applicant to provide any updates or changes to building design and retaining wall placement. Geotechnical report findings are anticipated prior to planning board. Then uh, another bullet, same section. Applicant should address the challenges to emergency access to the rear or northern building of Foster Street apartments. So my first question is on point one. Um, any updates or changes prior to planning board? Well, here's the planning board. I know there was an email that came out today but I guess this question is for staff. Is that what we were looking for prior to this meeting? Um, and then the second bullet, what are the emergency access concerns for this property? Okay, I, I guess I can address a, your second question fairly easily. Um, as far as emergency access um, has to do with um, the actual terrain, um, and getting around that second building because of the, um, the retaining wall and, and also the, the steepness of that. We're really limited as to how we're going to get around that building if we need to get around that building. We do know that the second building, we're not going to get a vehicle or a truck around there, and we've accepted that. We understand that. Um, we talked to Nancy. Moving that retaining wall um, because of the, the geography of what's going on is almost next to impossible. Um, and it's going to be, it'll be difficult. That is one of the reasons why, that is one of the other reasons why we stipulated that the building needs to be protected with a specific sprinkler system, which it will be, and the standpipe system. Um, so because of not just access as far as distance to the building, but around the building and into the building, which will be limited around the back side, those are why those fire department features or fire protection features are in place. Does that answer your question, Nelson? Uh, thank you, Mike. It, it absolutely provides, um, I think the fire department's perspective and in the TRT notes, I think it, it's really looking for what, what the applicant's response to that is. So hearing that from, from Mike, um, 
I'd, I'd like to hear from the applicant what Kevin and Nancy, what they think about that or what's been done or being done. I, I can share a little bit. Um, so the, we've also, you know, we were looking initially that we were hoping to get final approval tonight based on the last, the way, the trajectory of the way things were going. But then we belatedly realized that the seller of the property to us is triggering subdivision review by their um, disposition of the parcel to us. And that item is next on the agenda after this, and that requires two meetings. So we're not gonna be good to go in a final version from the city until August at earliest. So we really have another month to tweak this thing. I think we had enough to advocate for an approval tonight based on what we had designed, but since we have another month on the subdivision anyway, I think we would take advantage of that to maybe tweak things a little bit more. Um, but I, I would, Nancy, if you want to explain where we're at um, in terms of where, how we feel it's appropriate now, I think that's okay as well. So if I could just add a couple of things on that. Um, we certainly are respectful of the uh, comments that we received from the fire department. Uh, about access on that, what would be the northwesterly corner of the northerly building. Um, as Captain Hange uh, indicated, we do have a full fire protection system uh, in the buildings and uh, including the standpipe, all of the notations uh, required by the fire department have been specifically put on the plans uh, so that that information has been addressed from that perspective. Looking at the specific area in question on that corner, part of it is a natural slope um, that just, um, you know, you can walk along it. I've walked through that area. Um, but the retaining wall that shows up on the plan, uh, in that particular area, if you look very closely at the grading, although there's a wall shown there, um, it is an area that could be walked down uh, if you needed to. Um, with the comments that we've received from the geotechnical folks, uh, they're still kind of looking through that process, but it may be that part of that wall can be eliminated and it can be a slope, uh, a stabilized slope in that area. And with that, I think that will help to address some of the concerns that we received from uh, the fire department. We're still trying to work through that with the geotechnical information. And as Kevin indicated, that's something that we can work out at a staff level um, as part of the next upcoming uh, time period prior to final approval. And, and thank you, Kevin. You, you actually <laughs> addressed what was going to be my next point, which was we sort of had an order of operations problem tonight. But it sounds like you guys have the expectation that we're we're not going to reach the finish line tonight. So I think the best thing we can do, though, is uh, send you guys away with the right list of to-dos. Uh, so the next time we see you, you know, be as close as we can. Yeah. I think that's right. So what would the board like to do? Uh, can, I, uh, can I chime in on one more item that was sure. earlier on? I was, um, while the stormwater thing was going on, I was paging through my files and I found a very expensive looking traffic report from 2016, which is 36 pages from Goral Palmer, which I, I know cost more than my traffic letter for phase two. And um, in that on page six, talks about the site distances and the proposed driveway onto Washington at that time, Goral Palmer said it was 275 feet looking left and 400 feet plus looking right against the requirement of 250 feet. So I don't know what all that was based on or if the trees grew or were bigger or what, but that's what the, we had this, we had a full traffic impact study done for phase one and that was the, that was the engineer's uh, result for that particular item. Just wanted to, to point that out. Thank you. It seems that we're headed toward tabling this item until the next meeting. The applicant seems to want that. How does the board feel? Yeah, I mean, it sounds like you basically said, you know, we're gonna do, take an extra month or whatever. So that's either a withdrawal of the, the thing that's on, okay, thank you. <laughs> a withdrawal of the, of the action or, or tabling, one or the other, pretty obviously. Hey, John, do you mind if I ask a quick question of Nancy really quick? Um, How fast? In, in really seconds. Quick. I talk really fast. Okay. Um, Nancy, depending on the geotechnical review, 
do you anticipate any major changes that might affect the peer review or the stormwater based on that geotechnical review? Um, it really depends on what the final findings are. We, we do have the final report in on phase one. There are no changes associated with that. Um, phase two, it would be wall grading um, that may happen and maybe some adjustments on that northerly building. Um, but we just don't know at this point uh, on that. Okay. Is there a motion to table and continue this till the next meeting? Motion to table. Second? Second. I'll second it. Any discussion? All in favor, please. Okay. Well, thank you for, for your time, Nancy and Kevin. Thank you. And uh, thank you. I think it brings us closer to a uh, decision next time. So we do appreciate we, your feedback. We look forward to monopolizing your time next month. <laughs> thank you. You guys are getting paid by the hour, right? So what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> well, hold it. I'm Rick, not. We, we get, we except, get paid. Except for Kevin. Really? He's yeah. paying well, by the hour. <laughs> well, hold it. We get paid by the hours. Yeah, right. zero. <laughs> I'm spending by the hour. Exactly. So we're just, you know, have another meeting. Okay. The next item of business is a preliminary plan review for a major subdivision entitled Subdivision of Ellsworth Shopping Center for DK Ellsworth Shopping Center, LLC. The proposal is to, to subdivide and reconfigure approximately 22 and a half acres of land currently or previously owned by DK Ellsworth Shopping Center, LLC. Tax map 131, lots 13, 14, 17, and 25 into four lots consisting of 4.67 acres, the current site of Oreo Way townhouses, 10.96 acres, current site of the Ellsworth Shopping Center, 2.73 acres, the proposed site of the Foster Street Apartments Phase 1, and three acres, the proposed site of Foster Street Apartments Phase 2. The land is located in the urban and downtown zones. Who is representing the applicant this evening? Kim and I am. Oh, so we don't get to say goodbye to you right away. No, not yet. You stuck with me for a little longer. We'll deal with it. If you'll deal with us, we'll deal with you. So go ahead and talk to us about this. So, Ms. Chairman, um, as part of the last presentation, Kevin alluded to the fact that um, in creation of the lots to be conveyed to the applicant for the Foster Street Apartments project, that creates a uh, what would be the second and third dividing of the property owned by DK Ellsworth Shopping Center LLC. So that's the shopping center parcel itself. That includes the land area that was conveyed back in, uh, I think, 2017, 16, 17 time period uh, for what's now called Oriole Way Apartments. Um, and then the land <laughs> conveyed to uh, DC Pre-Development LLC for Foster Street Apartments, which would be conveyed in two lots and the right of way for the portion of Oriole Way that crosses the shopping center land. So it's um, no physical improvements are proposed, no uh, new infrastructure. It's simply the matter of dealing with the fact of the division of land that happened a number of years ago, coupled with the two new proposed lots for this project, uh, for the Foster Street project, trigger the need for a subdivision. Mm, this is within the five years. Correct. Span, right, okay. Yeah, so this doesn't, this is simply moving of lot, of lot lines essentially on paper, so. That's correct. Yeah. Questions from the applicant? Or not the applicant, from the board, I'm sorry. Unless you want to ask yourself questions. Thank you, John, I have one question. Mm -hmm. um, and it basically deals with the preliminary review comments right away. 
and I'm, I'm looking at the easement agreement at six pages. I think it might have actually been in the mm -hmm. Wilson Street Apartments, but I think it addresses this too. But on page two, just kind of curious, uh, just starting with paragraph four on page five. The grantor's deed is amended so its terms are mutual, namely that each of the grantor and grantee shall have the right to relocate that portion of Oreo Way that is located on their respective land as provided in said paragraph four. Um, it, does this open up that somebody may actually move Oreo Way? Uh, I, I just don't understand that. There was nothing, in, to my knowledge, as far as there's anything specific discussion about that, but it does allow the landowners who control each section of Oriole Way, if there were ever a need to make some minor adjustment or anything to that, that they would both be allowed to do that on their respective properties. There's no proposal to relocate Oriole Way. There's no proposal to you know, change it in any fashion, but it does allow them the opportunity, for example, if going through uh, the Oriole Way apartment site, something needed to be adjusted, it could, and it wouldn't affect the shared agreement between the two. But it would affect their, it would affect their approval from the planning board. This is true. Oriole that is correct. Therefore, that might complicate things because as I look at it right now, without deep thought, they couldn't move Ori away because they'd be in violation of their permit. Correct. And that would certainly raise issues with the title to these properties and might, in fact, cause the city to take enforcement action, essentially a stop work order on that. So you might want to carefully think about that easement language. It may be saying something that can't happen. It's a lawyer question. And I am not a lawyer. <laughs> Neither am I. I think you need to have the language in the easement and then it would be an amendment to the previously approved plan in order to change the location of the road. So you need to, you need to protect yourself through, a, through landowner agreements in the easement and then the planning board and the town, the city would get involved um, during the physical, any other changes. So I, I did, I think it's good to have it in the, in the easement, something like that. Understood. Anyone else? This is getting too easy. Come on. No one. Okay. This is a public hearing. Anyone might comment on this. Does anyone out there wish to speak? No one has anything for us. Nothing came through on the chat. And, uh, hmm. Dwight has nothing. Uh, Dwight has nothing. And Nate has nothing. Nothing. Okay, close the public hearing. Hmm. As, I, as I mentioned before, um, ah, and the technical review uh, comments. Applicants should clarify ownership of Oreo Way. If right of way is left as a common lot, applicants should include language of who would be responsible for the maintenance of the road. If lot will be sep a separate standalone lot, applicants should provide language for a road association. So what will the status of Oreo Way be? We, we've had a bit of a discussion um, with the applicant who would be ultimately, um, Kevin who would be ultimately owning it. Not sure Kevin's still on board here, um, but that end up, may end up being actually in an easement. It's shown on the plan uh, within a, a separate lot. And it may end up being an easement over uh, the lot that would be part of phase one. And, and if that's the case, the easement language that was submitted to you would be appropriate and still apply, uh, and there would be no need for an association. Uh, it would just simply be on the, the lot that's part of phase one as an easement, similar to what it is right now in uh, Oriole Way Apartments. 
Okay. So now I ask, what would the board like to do? This is a very simple subdivision. There's no, it's simply changing lot lines. It does not bring up any issues of storm water and so forth. Um, thoughts? I'll make a motion that the preliminary plan review for major subdivision entitled Subdivision of Elsner Shopping Center or DK Elsner Shopping Center LLC is complete. I will second that. Is there any discussion? All in favor, please indicate. Okay. So now everyone gets to go home, so to speak. Next item of business is adjournment. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Mr. Chairman. Yeah, excuse me? I said thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, there's a second, yes. All second. in favor, please indicate. Nate can go home now. Yay! Stay safe, guys. Happy Fourth of July. See you, everybody. Yeah.